with that said, in chapter 1 of Borg, he sets out what, in essence, is a battle for the Bible. Needs to be retired. Can I make it from here? No, way off. Don't sign me up for the basketball team. Um, Bork doesn't talk about it in these terms. But this is really what he's describing. This is actually the title of a best selling book from 1978 by a man named Harold Ruzel, um, who was not a Southern Baptist himself, but this book became the rallying cry. Uh, a certain faction within the old Southern Baptist Convention that led to the split of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, the largest Protestant group in the United States uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, the Bork talks about this battle for the Bible. He says it's, it, you know, you've got two major groups fighting about the Bible. What's one of them? Okay, so the fundamentalists. And what are some other terms he uses to describe them? Oh, the conservative. Yeah. Conservative. Evangelism. Pardon? Evangelism. Right. Yeah, sometimes there's, you know, evangelical is a term that's sometimes used, although evangelicals are, it's hard to characterize evangelicals. Even evangelicals don't know how to characterize evangelicals. <laughs> they're, they're conservative evangelicals. There are progressive evangelicals, and the progressive evangelicals typically are the millennial evangelicals who don't want to have anything to do with the conservative evangelicals. Um, that sort of thing. So lots of interesting things. Conscious Pardon? Conscious Yeah, and we'll come back to that in just a minute. But yeah, uh, that's one of the, the features, one of the characteristics of this. The other phrase he uses, and maybe somebody said it and I didn't hear it, he'll sometimes talk about Bible believing Christians. Um, this is a standard academic abbreviation for Christian. I have not taken Christ out of Christian. Uh, it's a poor imitation of the Greek letter chi, uh, which is the first letter in the Greek Christos. Uh, another standard abbreviation that I will use is theta, as in theos, for God. Uh, so we've got the fundamentalist slash conservative slash evangelical slash Bible-believing Christians on one side. Who's on the other side? Okay, there's sort of moderate, liberal, what other kind of language? Yeah. Well, I was going to say, you called them mainline church goers. Yeah. Really mainline Protestants. <coughs> uh, and I, I like to add, he doesn't use this term, but I like to add <coughs> the descriptor of confused mainline Protestants. Um, when you hear the mainline Protestant is a term that's used in sociology of religion, a lot of um, you know, that religious folks use it as a way of categorizing people. Who do you think of, if you're familiar with the term, who do you think of when you hear the term mainline Protestant? Mm. Okay, uh, big mega churches. Actually, those aren't. Those would typically fall on the other side. Uh, Lutheran would be one. Presbyterian, Episcopalian, uh, Methodist, um, United Church of Christ, the Old Congregationalists, um, some Baptists, American Baptist Churches USA, maybe. Um, these are these are denominations uh, that have historically been important for setting the, the tone of, of religious and civil life in the United States. Um, they have also been on a massive decline in membership for decades now, for 30, 40 years. Sometimes they're called old line Protestants. Sometimes they're, um, right. But we're talking about those sorts of groups. So like, you know, Centenary United Methodist Church across the street here would technically be um, mainline Protestant. Okay. All right. And as Borg sets out, we, we can distinguish these three groups, <clears throat> I'm sorry, these two groups, uh, by how they 
talk about the Bible when it comes to three different issues. One has to do with the origins of the Bible, the authority of the Bible, and then the interpretation of the Bible. What do fundamentalist conservative evangelical Bible believing Christians that group? On Borg's account, where does the Bible come from? God. It comes from God. It's, it's of divine origin. Uh, where does the Bible <coughs> come from, according to moderate, liberal, confused mainline Protestants? You, can, you have to read between the lines a little bit here. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's some, so there's some human authors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you say that the Bible is authored by human authors the way Romeo and Juliet is authored by Shakespeare or whatever, then yay! So, some people want to talk about divine influence, um, but there's, there's just, I, I don't know how to talk about the Bible, is ultimately what it boils down to. Um, why should people believe the Bible? How is its authority manifested? Um, according to Bible-believing fundamentalist conservative evangelical Christians, the authority comes from the Lord. Yeah, it's, it's the Word of God, right? So it's, it's clearly tied to the idea of origins. And because God said it, it's what? True. 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 Um, and it's true in everything. Words that are often used, associated with this by this class of Christians, this group of Christians, are that the text is inerrant and infallible in matters of science, history, religion, etc. Inerrant and infallible. Side note, I'll mention this again later on. The people who developed this language of inerrant and infallible, this language doesn't come into existence until after the Protestant Reformation. Um, and the, the, the serious scholarly versions of this belief in inerrancy uh, acknowledge that it only applies to the original manuscripts of the Bible. And they also admit we don't have the original manuscripts of the Bible. What we have is a careful reconstruction of what we think the originals were. So in many ways, this is sort of like a, a red herring. It's not relevant in the most technical sense of the term. But we'll come back to that when we talk about the, how the New Testament came to be. Uh, what about the authority of the Bible for moderate, liberal, confused mainline Protestants? Yeah, you know, over in Willett Science, no, not Willett, forget Willett for a second, over in the Science and Engineering Building, the physics people tell us the origin of the universe came to be through this Big Bang, not the TV show. Right. Um, the Bible says God created the universe in seven days, well, six days and a day of rest. Um, um, how do I put that together? Should I put that together? Right? Is the Bible true? You know, I mean, if the Bible is true in this literal historical way, what do I do with science and engineering? Hmm. So the, the book also mentions that the Bible believing Christians kind of can understand, like, when something's a metaphor or something, or yeah. if it was seven days or something. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and so there are some nuances to this, but the, 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 you know, again, there's this sort of overwhelming, I just don't know what to think, sort of thing. It's, it, actually, the reason mainline churches are declining is, is demographics. 
they're aging out, they don't have as many kids as the growing denominations that are growing in numbers. Uh, but I think part of it is that mainline Protestants have been so confused, they don't know what to think, and therefore, well, if they don't know what to think, why should I be part of it? But that's a story for sociology and religion. Um, but this idea of, of understanding metaphor and stuff brings up the, the, this issue of interpretation. On the whole, how do um, fundamentalist, conservative, evangelical, Bible-believing Christians interpret the Bible? Literally. And here we have to distinguish between some different kinds of liberalism. Board distinguishes between different kinds of liberalism. Um, there's this soft or natural literalism that I think you were alluding to. Which, okay, you read the Bible, and if the text said, one of my favorite texts, in Song of Songs, which is actually an X-rated erotic love poetry in the Old Testament, uh, the lover describes his partner in this way. Your neck is like the Tower of David. <laughs> Does that mean she's a giraffe? <laughs> right? I mean, anybody reading that knows, okay, now, it's not meant to be taken literally. That's a kind of natural living. You read the text literally, except for the parts that, you know, any old Yahoo can figure out. You know, trees clapping their hands, trees don't have hands. Right? Um, so there's that kind of soft or natural literalism. And then Borg talks about a hard or conscious literalism. What does he mean by conscious literalism? Even when it doesn't really make that much sense that they take it literally anyway, so yeah. like even when all evidence points to that being a metaphor or just false, they kind of ignore it. Yeah, I mean, one way of thinking about it is you have to consciously decide to ignore all kinds of other perspectives to take this text literally. So let's go back to the creation story in Genesis and whether that's true or the Big Bang Theory is true. For me to believe a literal account of Genesis requires me to consciously ignore what science says. And that's the kind of literalism that Borg suggests typically characterizes this group of people. We don't want to think about what physics says. We don't want to think about what biology says about evolution. You know, the Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. Have you seen the bumper stickers? Have you ever heard somebody talk that way? Right? The Bible said it. I believe it. I, that settles it. Why should I believe it? Because God said it, and it's true. If God said it, it's true. And if it's true, it's got to be literally true. Because God wouldn't lie. You know, these are the kind of questions that these folks will ask of these folks. But what can you guess? They're not sure how to interpret the Bible either. Well, do I take a little bit? Who do I believe? Do I believe in Big Bang Theory or do I believe in this reading of Genesis 1? It all just seems so, as uh, Steve Martin said in an old stand up routine, religion just seems so uh, arbitrary that, you know, I can't really take trust in. But then science, by virtue of its metaphysics, it's, uh, of its method excludes metaphysics, so I, you know, I can't trust science either. I just wouldn't know what to believe if it wasn't for my lucky astrology mood watch. Yeah. But you did mention that most people in that um, moderate area um, speak the Bible uh, metaphorically and also historically. Mm -hmm. to be. Yeah. And so these, these folks typically are going to want to, if if they don't give up at all, they're going to look at the history behind the text, you know, the literary nature of the text, that sort of thing. But it's certainly not as neat and tidy as over here. Um, a lot more room for interpretation here. Okay? Make sense so far? Of course he says, you know, if we really want to, to see the fault lines, or where these tensions between these groups come out, 
We see it when we talk about three different issues. What's one of them? Creation versus, Creation versus evolution. What's another? Homosexuality. Homosexuality. And what's the third? The history of Jesus. Who was Jesus really like? We'll spend a couple of days after we read the Gospels um, reconstructing what scholars say that we can re reconstruct about the life of the real Jesus. Um, right? You talk about those things, and all of a sudden everybody gets really nervous. I was... Uh, interim pastor of a church in another state several years ago. Thought itself a very progressive liberal church. Uh, we read one of Borg's books. We were studying an adult study group. Uh, the book was Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time. And they were all shocked. <gasps> and this is a supposedly progressive, liberal sort of Baptist church. Um, interesting. Yeah, so there's, you know, even for open-minded people, there are certain things that you just don't know what to do with. Okay. So all with me so far. Okay, and for Borg, this is the context in which most people are reading and thinking about the Bible today. Or if you're not one of those people who are reading and thinking about the Bible, you don't know anything about Christianity or whatever, this is the kind of rhetoric you will often hear. Does that seem fair enough? I mean we can come back and nuance it. Right? Um but a lot of times what people who aren't Christian here in the popular culture are these kinds of debates. So, how did all of this come to be? That's where more goes next. Um, and let me draw this backwards. So we've got this split. We've got the Bible-believing Christians the evangelical fundamentalist conservative group over here, and we've got the confused mainline Protestants over here. So we've, we've, we've split this apart. Where did it come from? Uh, he talks about how it grows out of an older version of Christianity that in essence runs into what we might call a prism or a sieve or something uh, that leads to them splitting apart. Now, this older version of Christianity, the sort of old consensus version of Christianity, says is characterized by uh, several different features. What's one of them? What'd you pick up from the reading? There are like six of them. Literalistic. Okay, it's literalistic. Moralistic. Yeah. Um, just one word about literalistic. This is more of the soft or natural literalism that Borg is talking about. Christianity on the whole is saying, unless there's clear reason to um, take texts, to not take texts literally, not to take texts literally, I'll try to get my grammar right. Unless there's good reason not to, you take it literally. So if the text says, um, you know, all these animals got in the ark and there was this huge flood, then you assume that that's what really happened. Unless there's good reason not to. Um, somebody, you said moralistic, is that right? Yeah. What does moralistic mean? Um, yeah, so the Bible is in, in some sense a, a rule book. Right? Tell you what you can eat, who you can have sex with, what you should spend your money on, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of owner's manual sort of thing. What else? Okay, so patriarchal, which means what? And so God is always pictured as a male, as a king, as a father. Leaders of Christian communities are always male. Actually, they're not, but even in the New Testament. Um, you know, in the family... Who's supposed to submit to whom? The wife's supposed to submit to the husband. Right? So, children to the father. Right? So you see how this works out. He says what we think it says. When we get to Ephesians, we'll unpack that a little more. Uh, what's another one? Doctrinal. Okay. And what does that mean? Kind of works based like it talks, the book talks about how you can recite the creeds without falling asleep or like without messing up. Yeah. So it's about right beliefs. The term orthodoxy literally means right belief. 
So the Bible tells us what we should believe about God, about Jesus, about all these other things. And it's all nicely encapsulated in the Nicene Creed or the Constantinople, uh, the, the uh, Apostles' Creed, known as the uh, Constantinopolitan Creed, really. Um, right? Or it's set out in um, you know, doctrinal statements and systematic theologies, those sorts of things. So right? this is like stuff that the Bible is already done? Yeah. So the, the, the Bible, in this case, uh, teaches us right belief. I mean, like all these. Yeah, all these, these are all characteristics of this older form of Christianity that's fractured over here. Okay. What's next? Exclusivistic. <coughs> okay, it's exclusivistic. Which means what? There's only one God. There's only one way to believe. Yeah. Jesus is the way. And what happens to anybody who doesn't believe in Jesus? Go straight to hell, go straight to hell, do not pass good, do not collect salvation, anything like that. And it's often based on, on Jesus in John's Gospel, who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me. And most people who quote that conveniently forget a couple of verses later where Jesus says, Why have ever sheep if you don't get caught? Well, still don't get cocky is my ad lib. But. Uh, but it's this idea that Christianity is the only way to the truth. And Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims are all going to hell unless they convert to Christianity. Atheists are going to hell if they don't convert to Christianity. And um, what's the last characteristic? Right? Afterlife. Yeah. Which means what? Right. Happy yeah. to salvation. If you read the Bible literally and you follow the rules, and part of the rules means you let males run things, you have the right beliefs, including this one, that Jesus is the only way, then you'll go to heaven. If you don't, tough shit. <laughs> R-rated version. There'll be an occasional R-rated outburst, but this is actually in keeping with different parts of the New Testament. It just doesn't get translated that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's all about getting to heaven. The only way this life matters <coughs> is to get me to heaven. Um, first year I taught, it was a Lutheran school. We were talking about stuff like this, and one of the students who was a catechized Lutheran said, well, you know, my grandma used to believe in this heaven and, stuff, and hell stuff and belief and all of that, but we all know all I have to do is do good things, you'll go straight to heaven. And all I could do is imagine in my head Martin Luther spinning in his grave, because that was the exact opposite of everything Martin Luther fought for. <laughs> right? But that's a kind of popular version of Christianity. You do the right things and you get in. And again, this is a kind of popular version of Christianity that if we were to date it, probably starts to emerge in the third or fourth century, well after the New Testament period, and continues up until we run into this, uh, this wall. Again, it's, and this is more popular Christianity versus official Christianity. Questions or comments? Okay. So, what do we run into here? What are the four factors that lead to the breakdown of this sort of consensus, older version of Christianity? Yeah. Okay. Which means what? Yeah, we, we start to realize that there's more than one religion out there. God forbid we even realize there's more than one Christianity out there. Right? And this, this oversimplification, learn more about this in church history, uh, religion 210. Um, in the West, through the Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church is the official religion. Now, can you believe we're in the East and the, the, the power and the trajectory that Eastern Orthodoxy is going on? At least as far as the West is concerned. Martin Luther comes and hangs his 95 theses on the door of Wittenberg Cathedral in 1517, I think it is, on Halloween. Um, sparks off the Protestant Re Reformation. And now all of a sudden, there's not one church anymore. There's Roman Catholic. 
give it a couple, you know, give it a few decades. Calvin comes along, we get the reform tradition. Get down into the 1800s, or is it the, no, 18th century, whenever, when was King Henry VIII? Whatever century he was in, it's not long after this, he's trying to have a, an heir, so he keeps divorcing, and he keeps marrying, divorcing, killing his wife until he gets the heir he wants, and the Anglican church is born. And all, all along the way here are dissenters from all of this called the Anabaptists who want to reject even baptism and state church and creeds and all this sort of stuff. There's not a single church anymore. There's not a single Christianity. And then we go into the age of so-called age of exploration and we realize, oh my gosh, there are people in India who have the decency, or they don't have the decency to believe in Christianity. There are Hindus and Buddhists over there. Right? Well, actually, back in the Middle Ages, we've already learned that there are Muslims in the world, and, and we can actually get along with the Muslims. Um, again, that's a whole other story. But we realize that not everybody believes the thing, the same thing. And we realize that there are good Buddhists, and there are bad Baptists. And that confuses things, right? There are even really good people who don't believe in God at all. One of my favorite professors in, in college uh, one of the most moral, conscientious persons I've ever met in my life at that point in his life was an atheist. And I thought, wait a second, this doesn't make sense. Right? Ow! What's that do to, to this? When there are a lot of Christians who are schmucks and a lot of non-Christians who are saints. Okay. What's another one? Another feature, another um, factor. Historical and cultural relativism. Yeah. Historical and cultural relativism. As we go out, we have to explore other cultures, get to know other cultures, and they don't do things the way um, British gentlemen do them or German gentlemen or whatever. And sometimes it's hard to understand how what they do different is wrong and bad. We also learn that our culture changes over time. You know, one of the factor parts of modernity, which is we'll get to in a minute, is that we develop a, a sense of history and see how, you know, for example, the Roman Catholic Church just didn't fall down from the sky. Uh, right? There's a long process of development and evolution. The way things were, the way things are, isn't the way things always were. What does that do? What does that do for? How can we say anything's true if it's always changing? I already mentioned modernity. And part of modernity is this idea of this historical consciousness, this realization that things change over time. But what else does Borg talk about? Or what does Borg really emphasize with modernity, about modernity? How our society and culture shapes our Okay, and more specifically within society, what, um, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, scientific method is a big part of this, right? I mean, who are you going to believe these days? Are you going to believe the scientist or are you going to believe the preacher? Really, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Who has more credibility in society, right? Usually it's the scientist. If I say, you know, the scientific evidence shows doesn't that carry more weight than, well, the Bible says? Because we all know that the Bible can be interpreted in lots of different ways, but science is science, right? Um, so trust in science, human reason, technology, that gives us the facts, the hard facts. That's what we can rely on. And all of a sudden, we realize that this gets really mushy. Can I prove that God exists in the same way that I... Can I let me put it this way. Can I be as certain that God exists as I can be certain that there are quarks? Hmm. Hmm. That's the challenge that modernity, one of the challenges that modernity throws up to all of this. Right? And so in some sense, what happens here is that this group of people want to pretend that none of this happens. 
And this group here knows we've got to make peace with it, but we sure don't know how. We can't pretend that these sort of things have not happened. Not in good conscience. Now, I'm stereotyping both sides. I'm caricaturing both sides. We'll talk about caricatures before we're done. Does that make sense? And then, according to Borg, modernity is replaced by what? Postmodernity. And he doesn't talk about it this way, but while postmodernity is is really calling the question of convictions of modernity. The way I do this in my history of Christian thought or even history of Christian ethics, uh, I'm working on Conroe Cinema, my church history professor at Cinema. A, a convenient place to date the emergence of postmodernity is 1945. What happened in 1945? World War II. World War II ended, and it ended how? Yeah, we dropped the atom bombs on targeting civilian populations. Uh, the only nation in the world to ever drop uh, an atomic bomb on anybody else and deliberately target civilians. I'm not making an editorial judgment. That's a fact that we just need to acknowledge. Um, I have witnessed veterans at Pearl Harbor, Veterans World War II, debate whether or not it was necessary to do that, whether actually more lives were saved doing that or not. It's an interesting, interesting discussion, but it's a fact. Right? Where did we get the atom bomb? Science, Science technology, rationality. As Allied troops opened up the concentration camps in Germany, what did they find proof of? We actually knew long before that that it was going on, but we denied it. When we liberated the concentration camps, what did we find had been going on? The Holocaust, the mass murder, right? The, the Germans, and I'm not speaking of the Germans as a people at this point, because I love Germany, but um, think about it. A nation, whether deservedly or not, was held to be one of the most culturally advanced nations in the world, one of the most Christian nations in the world, had science, used science, technology, rationality to come up with a very, very efficient killing machine to try to wipe the Jews off the face of the earth and other undesirable groups. World War II is a convenient place to say, to think about dating the beginning of post-modernity. Why? Because it's, really? We're going to put this much faith in science and technology and rationality? It can be used for inhumane, destructive purposes as easily as it can be used for humane purposes. Really? Of course, we conveniently forget that when Russia, or Soviet Union, was threatening, <coughs> and we go into this orgy of science and technology, you know, STEM education. We didn't call it back in the fifties. I wasn't alive. This is history to me. But um, STEM education in the fifties, because we didn't want to get lost to the Russians. And people still start asking these questions. Well, why was this for? And the cultural uh, revolutions of the sixties happened. Where are we now? Well, you know, who cares about anything but STEM? Are we setting ourselves up for another problem? It's an interesting question. Uh, but this is, you know, postmodernity is willing to acknowledge the limits of these things. Realize that um, science, reason, technology has to have a goal. It has to have a purpose, and not just any goal or any purpose, but a good one. Right? Y'all been following news stories about the drug company that's raised the price of epinephrine? EpiPens up to what six hundred dollars wholesale from you know, thirty or whatever it was, right? Mm -hmm. I've got a goal: make profit. Is that a goal worthy of pursuing? Maybe profit is a goal worthy of pursuing, but in relation to what other goals? How is science or technology going to answer that for us? You see the kind of questions that postmodernity raises. And in the, in the aftermath of all of this, this is editorial comment, 
what we really see a lot of people doing is doubling down on science technology. Other people saying, screw it, and go out into some sort of irrationality. Right? Oh, I just want to do whatever I feel like. Which is good advice. Sometimes. Augustine famously said, love and do what you will. Uh, if you love the right things in the right way, yeah, go ahead. But if you don't love the wrong things, if you love the right things in the wrong way, you're going to create problems for yourself. Um, so this is where we live in postmodernity. Um, again, I'm riffing a little bit beyond board. For what it's worth, editorial comment here. There's about a three to four hundred year period of transition between the ancient world and the medieval world, medieval world to modern world. I think postmodernity is going to be another one of those three to four hundred year long periods of transition. Guess why it's not going to be settled in my lifetime or your lifetime. It's going to be a fun time to be alive. I mean, I mean that seriously. It's going to be frustrating as hell. It's going to be exasperating. It's going to be fun all at the same time. If I'm right, we'll know in about four hundred years. Okay. Uh, so this is where we've come from, according to Borg. Questions or comments about his arguments so far? So yeah. did the wall kind of start with Martin Luther? Was that kind of the starting point for that? Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't date it as much. Um, you can date it, I think really you can date it going as far back as the Renaissance and the Reformation, setting up the stage for all of this. Um, but most historians, uh, uh, intellectual historians, will talk about modernity emerging somewhere in the 1500s, 1600s, and uh, people like Descartes and Francis Bacon become sort of the poster children, the signposts for the development of modern thought, in very philosophically, scientifically, those sorts of things. Yeah. So where does like the Orthodox Church versus the Catholic Church kind of fit into this? Because like I understand the Reformation created you know, yeah. Protestants, yeah. but even before that, there were two denominations. Of the so how do they fit into it? Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a good question. Borg doesn't tell us, does it? This is part of the story that Borg leaves out, which is not necessarily to fault him. It's just to acknowledge this is a gap in the story. Um, I'm not enough of an historian of either orthodoxy or Catholicism. Um, but there are these kinds of tensions, maybe not expressed these same ways, but there are these same kinds of tensions, say within the Roman Catholic Church, between um, Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. Right? Um, you know, more conservative tendencies, more progressive tendencies. And quite frankly, these tendencies exist in all religious traditions, from what I can tell. Um, exist in all religious uh, traditions. And every religious tradition tries to negotiate these. Um, you know, again, to put too fast a loose on, on the Catholic uh, theological history, Vatican II, uh, John Paul the XXIII, John the XXIII uh, calling Vatican II, wanted to throw open some fresh air, literally said, he used the phrase, I want to throw open the windows of the Vatican and let in some fresh air. And so the, the Roman Catholic liturgy was, was reformed. People uh, could worship in their own language, not in Latin, a variety of things. John Paul, I mean, yeah, John XXIII, I'm saying John Paul, John XXIII uh, died very, uh, before the end of Vatican II. The next Pope, Paul VI, kept trying, and every Pope since has been trying to close those windows that John the 23rd had opened. Uh, Francis is now trying to open them up again. So again, there are these kinds of tensions. I mean, every religious tradition, whether Catholic, Protestant, Eastern Orthodox, Buddhist, whatever, uh, has to wrestle with these sorts of things. Muslim scholars are saying that Islamic fundamentalism represents something akin to this. And I've got to be careful how I say this. Something akin to this is a rejection of um, these changes in the world and a desire to get back to something that existed earlier. In some way, that's true of every fundamentalism, whether it's Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, uh, Muslim, or anything else. Okay. Um, 
one more comment. Borg also tells us in this chapter, well, two more comments. Borg also tells us in this chapter what he's going to do in the rest of the book, which is to say, let's find a way to overcome this. Are we stuck here? Or is there a way that we can come together and find these new lenses through which to read the Bible? So that's what he's going to be doing in the rest of the book. And as we read further, as we talk in class, you can decide whether you're convinced by it or not. Um, so that's one comment. This is where the book is going. Second comment, um, if I had given a quiz today over board, I would have asked something like, what are two of the four factors in the breakdown of this older version of Christianity? Or what is one of the characteristics of this older Christianity? Or how do mainline Protestants and Bible-believing Christians differ on the origin of the Bible, something like that. These are the main ideas. Does that make sense? What we have done today, in essence, is model, to some extent, what it means to read a text for what the author says, not what we call the healing truth by. To be able to reconstruct the main points of the author, the line of arguments. And we can come back and particularly look at it by saying, hey, he leaves out two really important groups. Um, Another question you can ask, do you see yourself in one of these things? Does the description... Hmm? So I think what he's trying to do again is to 